So our uh, next speaker is purely commercial, uh, the Boeing Commercial Crew Program, and uh, so the Deputy Program Manager of Operations for that program, the Boeing Commercial Crew Program, Christopher Ferguson. Christopher, good to have you with us. Thank you. Thanks, Gordon. Great. Good afternoon. Um, and I'd like to thank the Academy Organizing Committee for inviting Boeing to uh, give you an update on how we're doing on the Commercial Crew Program. Um, Kirk Sharman, I think, gave a real good teaser, uh, and I think he deferred some of the questions to both myself and Gwen. So this will be your opportunity to sort of see where we are, see where we're getting ready to fly, and uh, enjoy some of the excitement of the trip along the way. I'd like to thank Bonnie for uh, inviting me out here and keeping me close to my friends in Houston. Uh, we do spend an awful lot of time out here now. Um, as, uh, as we'll talk about shortly, uh, we, uh, we have moved uh, some of our operation out to Florida. However, uh, we have a big anchor here in, uh, in Houston. We'll conduct all of our crew training here in Houston. Our training system is here. Our training devices are here. Uh, our mission planning will be here, and our flight ops will be here. So uh, it's, uh, we're proud to have a, a footprint still remaining in, uh, in the Center of Human Space Play here at the Johnson Space Center. That's a great first chart. Let's try one more time. There we go. Um, okay, so let's talk a little bit, and, and I think it's been hinted around a little bit about really what is the commercialization of, of low Earth orbit. And, and I like to distill it down to common denominators, and, and I'll, I'll, I'll communicate it this way to you. Previously, in the, in the four human spaceflight programs, uh, launch programs that have existed before this, uh, the government owned the design, and they contract out, contracted out to, um, to providers like Rockwell and Boeing and Lockheed to build the vehicles for them. In a commercial model, uh, NASA announces that they have a service they want provided. They want their or astronauts transported to low Earth orbit, but they allow the contractors to, uh, to innovate, right? They give them a set of requirements. They say, you go innovate, and when you're all done, we're going to buy services off you, but you will own the intellectual property. So therein lies the, the difference, is when this is all done, uh, and after we've served our flagship customer, which of course is NASA astronauts, uh, we'll have opportunities to do things beyond uh, the flagship customer, which is NASA. Um, and what commercial, I think, does for NASA is it really enables them to go forth and concentrate on the exploration mission. Uh, what are we going to do with SLS? Right? Where, where are we going to build our deep space gateway? Are we going to the lunar surface? Are we going to Mars? And uh, an analogy I've used uh, several times in the past is that if Mars is the pinnacle of Everest, uh, low Earth orbit is base camp. And we envision a world where the, uh, the commercial providers are the Sherpas that haul the cargo to low Earth orbit to allow NASA to go forth and perform its exploration mission. Um, our contract is design, build, test, and, uh, and transport uh, astronauts and cargo to low Earth orbit. Um, NASA has actually built a really good requirement set for us to work off of. Um, it's a, it was a fairly condensed document, which means uh, there's a lot of room in there for innovation on behalf of all of us. Now, NASA rides very close side saddle. They keep a close eye on us to make sure in the very end, when we have to verify our design, it meets the requirements, but it gives both of the providers a lot of latitude to do things their way. Uh, we are actually on contract for two test flights, and uh, you'll hear us say a couple times today that our test flights are scheduled for this year, so it's going to be a very exciting year uh, here in Houston and out at the Kennedy Space Center. Uh, our first flight will be an uncrewed test flight, followed by uh, a crewed test flight, and then we have six service missions uh, on contract that will take us through 2024. Uh, 2024 right now is, uh, is sort of the limit to which the International Space Station is funded. Um, the, we've done a lot of studies. I know the, the Boeing team has done studies to confirm that the ISS can, in fact, be supported longer than 2024, up to 2028. But right now, that is the uh, that's the um, uh, that will be the end of the ISS. Uh, but of course, talks are in way, and it's a wonderful platform uh, to continue for either government service or perhaps a, a government-private partnership. Uh, there's our timeline on the bottom: uh, test flights on the uh, 2018 service missions from 2019 through 2024. And then uh, why, we would all be silly to be doing this if we didn't anticipate business well beyond that, whether it's commercially to the International Space Station or perhaps to other providers that may desire to build an outpost in low Earth orbit uh, for, uh, for either uh, commercial purposes, fabrication of, uh, or manufacturing. Uh, we've we've talked a little bit today about drug development. 
Um, tourism, of course, is, is an option. And then uh, one we haven't talked about is other countries that may be interested in, in leasing a space program so they can enjoy some of the benefits and the privileges associated with it without developing <coughs> the infrastructure of their own. Uh, we'll just walk real quick through what a typical mission would look like. Uh, we'll start in the lower left. Uh, we are, are building the spacecraft, which is the part that the humans will go to the International Space Station and back in. We are launching on top of an Atlas V booster. Uh, the Atlas V has been in service since the early 2000s. It's uh, uh, got a great safety record. It's flown 74 plus times with I think their 75th flight coming up here a week from today and they'll launch a uh, GO satellite from the Kennedy Space Center. Uh, following launch, we'll dock with the space station within 24 hours. Uh, we'll remain there for up to 210 days. Uh, the, uh, the lifeboat, if you will, will be there in case we have to, for some unforeseen uh, reason, rapidly leave uh, the space station, but we don't anticipate that. We anticipate staying for the full six month duration. And then we'll undock uh, with the original astronauts that, that, we, uh, that we transported there, and uh, we'll be back on the ground within uh, six hours of undock. Um, our model is to return to one of five pre-positioned landing sites in the Western United States. We've picked them all, and we're out developing the infrastructure necessary to support ground operations uh, out there. Uh, upon recovery, um, the conical portion will, uh, will be reused up to 10 times. The service module is discarded. That's the cylindrical portion, and that will end up in the Pacific Ocean. But we'll, we'll, uh, we'll transport the conical portion back to Florida. We'll refurbish it and we'll use it up to, uh, we'll reuse it up to 10 times. So spacecraft itself, we have three different vehicles, uh, three crew modules under construction right now at our factory uh, in, uh, in Florida, and three different service modules. Uh, they have come on the tail end of our structural test article. Uh, structural test article we use to bend, twist, we vibrate it, we shock it, make sure it meets its structural uh, designs. Uh, we built one of those already, that's out in our facility to, in Huntington Beach getting tested as we speak. Uh, we've also built a, um, uh, what we call a hot fire test article, which is a full up service module, and that is currently out at the White Sands test facility awaiting its, uh, its test series, which is forthcoming. Uh, I did mention already that we're going to launch in an Atlas V booster, uh, proven rocket. We've made some upgrades to Space Launch Complex 41 at the Cape Canaveral Air Force Station uh, in Florida. The humans have never launched off this pad before. So we had to go make some infrastructure changes, and I have some images coming up in just a moment. I did mention, however, that uh, we do have, uh, we have an anchor here in Houston with our mission operations team. This is, in effect, a NASA team that we have leased back from NASA. Uh, these are the same, uh, by name, uh, a lot of the same individuals who work the very tail end of the shuttle program, so I consider them the foremost expert in their field, and, uh, and our ground processing uh, team out in Florida. Um, so I mentioned building, testing, training, integrating. We're, uh, we're testing all over the United States. As I had mentioned, um, we, uh, we just concluded a test series up at the Langley Research Center where we've dropped our vehicle, and you'll see a, an image of that in, a, in a, a video in just a second. But we've done several tests to make sure there's Otto, our test dummy. We've dropped him a few times to make sure he's going to stay healthy through all of this, and he's come through with flying colors. Uh, in the center in the bottom there, you see Sonny Williams uh, using a part of our training system. And then ultimately, we are going to integrate with the International Space Station team. Uh, an integrated sim is sort of a, uh, a big milestone for, for any program, and we're going to conduct our first integrated simulation with the ISS Flight Control team uh, next Wednesday, I believe it is, uh, or Thursday the 18th. So that's, that's a big milestone for us as well. Uh, I talked a little bit on the left-hand side about the structural test article and the service module hot fire test article over on the right side. Uh, we have, I mentioned, three, uh, three spacecraft under construction crew modules. The first one will execute our pad aboard test. That's a fairly significant test, very dynamic. Uh, it essentially tests our ability to use our ejection seat. I call it an ejection seat for a rocket. We have to be able to escape from the rocket uh, while we're static on the launch pad. Uh, the vehicle will go up about a mile, out to sea about a mile, and it'll safely uh, uh, bring the astronauts down into a, to a water rescue. So we're going to test that. We're going to test it in the desert. But that's where we're going to test our system, and you'll see that sometime this summer. Uh, our orbital flight test vehicle, this is our uncrewed vehicle. Uh, that's, uh, that's scheduled for a flight in the third quarter of this year, and our crewed flight test vehicle scheduled in the fourth quarter of this year. I mentioned uh, some of the launch infrastructure that, uh, changes that we've made, uh, and the, the Atlas V, uh, which is a first stage booster. Second stage is a Centaur. Uh, 
some of the bigger changes, and, and largely it's a stack, it's a stock Atlas V. Two of the more significant changes is we've added another engine to the second stage. It's called a dual engine Centaur, which is a previously flown configuration, just never on the Atlas V. That's to give us added abort performance. And then um, uh, you see the, uh, oh, and the emergency detection system. Um, I mentioned an injection seat for a rocket, right? That's how we would get away from a rapidly disintegrating booster behind us. We, of course, never expect something like that, but it's a NASA requirement. And we, of course, we want to we maintain safety in the, the most dynamic phases of flight. Um, the pilot uh, or the commander is probably unable to make those kind of quick decisions. He doesn't have that information at his disposal because it's very dynamic and things could degrade very quickly. So we actually install a system on the rocket itself to detect whether bad things are happening and it would send a message to tell the crew module to abort and uh, keep the astronauts safe. A lot of testing on the right hand side. There's a good image of sort of the whole stack uh, that, uh, that will eventually be mounted to the top of the Atlas V. That's our structural test article. Uh, in the top in the center are launch abort engines. We have a pusher abort system and you'll see a, a demonstration of one of those test fires come up in just a second. We've done an enormous amount of wind tunnel testing just to certify that the entire design works the way we anticipate. And as I had mentioned, we do uh, all of our training here at the Johnson Space Center right across the lake. All these images are taken. As a matter of fact, I believe some of you had an opportunity to take a tour over to uh, Building 9, the mock-up facility, and see the Starliner <coughs> uh, logo on the side of our mock-up over there. Well, what you, I don't think, had the opportunity to see was our mission simulator in Building 5. Uh, we also have a, a floating test article that's in the neutral buoyancy lab, which is a little bit further north. But really, the whole team is right here in, in Houston, Texas, and we're proud to be a, a, part of, uh, a part of the continued human spaceflight infrastructure. Uh, operational readiness, a big year for us. Uh, Boeing builds a lot of airplanes, but typically we sell them to other people. We don't operate them ourselves. In this particular case, we're going to build and operate uh, up to 10 times. So uh, getting the team ready for, uh, for these kind of operations, you know, they say in, in space flight, the first inch is the hardest, right? Getting off the pad is the most difficult part. And unless the team is well honed and ready to go, uh, we're, uh, you know, we don't want to do that. We want to be ready when the, uh, when the rocket's ready. So once again, uh, we are, uh, NASA is the flagship customer. Uh, we're servicing them. We're lo working lockstep with them. We have the crew involved in a lot of our activities. Uh, we meet with them on a regular basis, and they keep a very wary eye on the way that uh, we're implementing the, uh, the requirements that have been levied upon us. But after that, um, I'll, I'll say the sky's the limit. You know, is it tourism? Is it servicing a private space station? Is it, is it uh, working uh, other nations that are interested in space programs of their own? So there's a lot of potential out there. Um, I think, th yeah, that's my last chart. We got a short video I'd like to show you, and then maybe we have time for a question or two. So can we roll the video?
So, uh, Christopher, if you take a few questions here, and, and so I have one question. I mean, I, I'm, although I spent eight years in government, I'm really 40 years in business, and uh, so commercial to me means profitable, but of course we also invest in programs for the future. So, is this profitable at this point, or are you investing and in hopefully future business? I mean, how does this stand with Boeing? Well, I think Boeing's obviously a for-profit company. Um, now, that said, uh, I think this has been a great benefit to the taxpayers. And, and let me just elaborate a little bit. I, I use, um, I use uh, $3 billion a year to operate the space shuttle, right, our, our former vehicle. And, and that was, it was $3 billion a year, which equated about six flights. Uh, so over two years, right, $6 billion, if you look at the combined value of the contracts that uh, are worked by Boeing and SpaceX, it adds up to about $6 billion. And for that, you're getting uh, two times, two test flights, full development, and six service flights to the International Space Station. So it's definitely a benefit to the taxpayers. I think commercial companies are the way to go. Right? We're, bringing the, uh, we're bringing the cost down to them. And ultimately, you know, and of course, Boeing wouldn't be in this if, if it, there wasn't um, profit margin at the end of it all. So it is. Good. Okay, so we have any questions uh, for, let's have to look at, okay, here we go, yeah. Is this thing on? Hey, Fergie, thanks for a great presentation. Um, my question is around uh, who might be flying uh, your vehicle. Uh, I know the initial cadre, government cadre have been selected, but is there any announcement or any, any decision made on who might be the first um, or the, the first group of commercial astronauts, test pilot astronauts uh, for the vehicles, particularly uh, yours? So um, as you'd said, uh, Box, there's, uh, f there's four cadre <coughs> astronauts from which we anticipate NASA to pick at least one. Um, now they'll be paired with a Boeing test pilot in, in sort of this joint test team concept. Uh, it's, it's not too much different than the way the military test airplanes, right? I have a government and I have a contractor uh, test person go do this. So I would anticipate you'll see, because we do want to fly crew by the latter part of this year, an announcement on the part of NASA and Boeing uh, of what, who the crew members and the constituency crew might be. And I would anticipate that sometime in the springtime if you just look at the amount of time it takes to train them. So that's not been announced yet for Boeing? I'm sorry? It's not been yet announced for Boeing? It has not, no. Okay, thank you. Any other questions? Hard to see. Okay, good. Thank you very much. Uh, <laughs>